When people hear the word philosophy, they tend to disregard whatever said next as pseudoscience. After all, how can something as trivial as people sitting around theorizing about the universe really compare to other, more highly regarded forms of science? Merriam-Webster's dictionary defines the word science as knowledge or a system of knowledge covering general truths or the operation of general laws, especially as obtained and tested through the scientific method and concerned with the physical world and its phenomena. A definition such as this makes most people understand science as a rock-solid source of knowledge, truth through established evidence. The thought of questioning something like gravity or quantum mechanics seems absurd when it's established through science. In comparison, people tend to mock much of what philosophy has to say. What's ironic here is that gravity and quantum mechanics are two theories, out of many, which were realized through practicing philosophy the proper way. Don't believe me? I'm sure you've heard of Albert Einstein, right? You know, the older chap with stereotypically messy hair. But believe it or not, he along with a brilliant scientist named Niels Bohr actually made unbelievable progress in quantum mechanics through properly practicing philosophy. In fact, they had philosophical debates specifically on that very topic for over a decade. Without those philosophical debates, many of our current theories and discoveries wouldn't be around today. So how has something as simple as philosophy led to such brilliant breakthroughs? It all starts in the 1920s with a physicist named Werner Heisenberg. Heisenberg suggested that the Newtonian elements, space and time, didn't exist in matrix mechanics. Then, Max Born came out with the theory that matrix mechanics were based entirely on probability and statistics, instead of any type of certain outcomes. This upset Einstein because he was inclined to believe that there was more certainty in the universe than just the different outcomes of varying odds. He was actually so upset by this that he directly contacted Born and said, I, at any rate, am convinced that God does not throw dice. About a year later, Heisenberg and Born announced that at the Solvay conference that their theory on quantum mechanics was complete. This really set Einstein off. He was absolutely sure that it was only a stepping stone theory and needed to show the science community the truth. Niels Bohr, however, felt the exact opposite. In fact, he created the principle of complementarity to help incorporate the new science. This resulted in a philosophical debate between the two scholars that would last for more than 10 years. Einstein's first attack on the theory was exactly one year later, at the next Solvay conference. He argued that a monochromatic beam projected through plates with slits in them, like the ones we have here, would have certain predictable results. He theorized that if the light beam traveled through the A slot and bounced off the bottom of the slit, it would then rebound towards the B slot and contact the F plate in a predictable, non-interference manner. If the photon is not watched or illuminated with any type of device, and it still created an interference pattern on the F plate, then it had to result in the current quantum theory being accurate. The key to the experiment would be monitoring where the photon contacted the plates by measuring plate recoil, not actually watching the photon. Bohr's only response was that it was impossible to determine if that method would actually disprove the principle of indeterminacy. He said that in order to see where the photon had landed, and what it had potentially interfered with, we would need to use amplifying apparatuses that would interfere with the experiment itself. That thought experiment would have to be written off due to what would later be known as the measurement problem. About three years later, Einstein was back for round two. He had devised an experiment to disprove the relation of the indeterminacy between time and energy using something later called Einstein's box. Inside the box, there was electromagnetic radiation and a clock to release the radiation systematically. Using his theory of E equals mc squared and the amount of time the shutter on the box was open, he can determine the exact energy of the photon. Doing so could potentially prove the frequency of the photon to be less than it would be through the indeterminacy of time and energy theory. Bohr was devastated, but was determined to develop a counterpoint. He theorized that Einstein's experiment could once again not be measured. This time it was because the actual position of the box could never really be determined due to gravitational forces and the difficulty of returning the box to its original state after releasing the photon. Because of that, the energy of the photon could never be accurately attained. Once again, Einstein was defeated. Eventually, Einstein admitted that it is impossible to simultaneously determine the characteristics of a photon. He didn't, however, agree that they don't have precise values. 
He simply wouldn't believe that Qantas acted entirely probabilistically and stated that the newfound discovery was valuable, yet transitory. It does not tell the whole story, is what he had to say about it. Now at first glance, it appears that philosophy, in Einstein's case, didn't do much for the scientific community. But in all actuality, it made a huge impact. Without people like Einstein, scientists would never doubt their own theories. Beyond that, philosophy itself will often lead to new discoveries without negatively impacted current theories. Breaking down how philosophy actually works and what it does for the scientific community as a whole, you start to realize exactly what a brilliant man once said to me. Philosophy done properly is science. Philosophy done poorly remains philosophy.